Many on the Democratic side are looking past midterm elections to 2020. And for a party leader, former San Antonio Mayor Julian Castro emerged as a rising star in the party back in 2012 when he delivered the keynote speech at the Democratic Convention. He later served as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under President Obama and recently told Rolling Stone magazine that he's likely to run against President Trump. He is also the author of a new memoir called An Unlikely Journey, Waking Up from My American Dream. And Julian Castro joins us now, Mr. Secretary, thanks so much for being with us. Um, Thank you for having me. Let me ask you about your decision to run in 2020. When do you think uh, you will actually be closer to making the decision? Because to talk about it very openly like this is not something we always hear this far out. Yeah, well, you know, I think that you should be straightforward with folks. Mm -hmm. And so I've said that uh, uh, I'm going to make a decision right after the November 6th election. Mm -hmm. I'm focusing my time between now and November 6th on trying to help candidates that are actually on the ballot uh, in this midterm, because I do think that that needs to be the priority for everyone. Uh, but right after that, I'm going to make a decision. And basically, it's going to come down to two things. The first one is, is personal. Uh, of course, my family and I have talked about the idea of me running, but we haven't had that sort of step back, long kind of conversation that a decision like that merits. And then secondly, uh, as I get throughout the country helping candidates who are running in this cycle, uh, I want to hear what people are saying. Uh, what the mood of the country is. And I want to see what happens on November 6th, because I do believe, uh, I'm convinced that these midterms set the mood for the country over the next couple of years. There's a lot of anger out there, as you well know, and there's a lot of incivility. I think people on both sides would actually agree on that point. Is that a factor at all in your decision? When you talk about your family and weighing this decision with them, is that a consideration at all? Well, the tone of yeah. our politics. Of course then? it is, but I think especially at times like these, uh, when there's so many folks, especially our president, that are trying to divide people, uh, that we need leaders at every level, wh whether it's local, state, or federal, uh, in the public sector and the private sector, that are trying to unite people. And so right now is not a time either for uh, citizens or for public officials to throw up their hands and say, you know, I just don't want to do this right now. Uh, it's actually a time for uh, people of goodwill, people that want to unite the country to step up. Have you talked to President Obama about a potential 2020 run? I have not. I have not. But, uh, you know, it was the honor of a lifetime to get to serve him uh, at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, and I can't believe uh, how far uh, in many ways we've fallen since uh, the president, President Obama, left office. Do you plan on reaching out to him in order to kind oh, of, of course, weigh the different yeah. considerations before you make your decision? Of course. I, I look forward to reaching out to former President Obama, of course, to um, Hillary Clinton, uh, Bernie Sanders, other folks who have run. I think that um, I think that the country is ready for a new generation of leadership in this country. And uh, but there are a lot of folks that have a lot to offer in terms of their experience and their perspective. What do you think so far of President Obama's role in the midterm elections? I'm glad to see him out there. You know, nobody can rally uh, the base of the party the way that Barack Obama can. And I think nobody is better about explaining uh, our aspirations and what we can be as a country than President Obama. Uh, I just saw that he's going to be in Nevada in a few days. I'm excited about that because we have a good Senate pickup opportunity where Jackie Rosen is taking on Dean Heller. Uh, and so I say the more that he can get out there, the better. So uh, let's talk about your book. You write this about running for office at, quote, a candidate needs to tell folks in simple terms what he or she stands for. Uh, you've been campaigning, as you said, for Democrats uh, running this year. Do you think that candidates uh, nationwide have been doing that, explaining what it is that they stand for? Oh, I think a lot of them have. Not everybody, but a lot of them have. Uh, in fact, we have this very impressive uh, group of young, dynamic leaders, folks like Andrew Gillum, 
who was running for governor in Florida, Stacey Abrams in Georgia, Beth O'Rourke in Texas, uh, who have set this blueprint of combining concern for uh, economic issues and economic advancement for everybody, and also racial justice, uh, and making sure that everybody is able to succeed in this country, and the American dream is possible, no matter the color of your skin or how much money your folks have or don't have. So yeah, I think there are a lot of folks that that have been telling people in simple terms what they stand for: universal health care, investing in pre-K so that everybody can get off to a great start in education, making sure that people can go to college without having $100,000 or more in student loans when they get out, that if they want to buy a house, uh, and they can do that. Uh, those kinds of things that impact people in their daily lives. Um, we have a good crop of folks this time that are doing that. You mentioned Congressman O'Rourke. Did you watch the debate uh, that he had against uh, Senator Ted Cruz, uh, that Texas Senate debate? You know, there had been some talk that perhaps uh, people wanted to see a more aggressive uh, Congressman O'Rourke in that last debate. What did you think of it? Uh, that he did a fantastic job. Uh, I didn't get to see all of the debate, but I did see some of it. Uh, I thought he was crisp. I thought that he drew contrast with Senator Cruz very well. Uh, and, and really, you know, uh, Beto O'Rourke represents, I believe, uh, the spirit of Texas, uh, of folks who think big, uh, who want to pursue big goals, uh, who are big enough to tackle issues like immigration and health care and make sure that everybody can, can succeed if they work hard. And I see Ted Cruz as trying to go backward and also very much uh, a man of a certain moment. And that moment was the Tea Party. And that moment passed. And I believe that uh, Beth O'Rourke can win on November 6th. The last polling we saw, though, has actually Senator Cruz up by six points. What do you think Congressman O'Rourke needs to do to try to close the gap? He needs to rally the base of the party. Uh, he needs to make sure that the base gets out there and votes. The challenge in midterm years, not just in Texas, but anywhere, is that uh, folks who tend to vote in presidential years, uh, especially people of color, lower income individuals, they don't vote at the same rate uh, during the midterm. And so he has the resources, he has the inspirational uh, charisma, uh, he has the message, and I think that he can do it. Um, you write this in your book of our nation's politics that it's gone in the direction of, quote, less substance and more shout shouting, but that Washington had not always been that way. Do you think that it can or will change by 2020? I think that my hope, at least, is that if the American people send a strong message to Washington by at least uh, putting control of the House of Representatives in the hands of Democrats and balancing things out, that there's going to be more accountability. And this president always likes to say that he's a deal maker, but we really haven't seen that yet. You know, we can always hope that uh, if, if he has to work with the Democratic Congress, that he may take a different approach than he has so far. Uh, I don't know that all of that is going to change by 2020. Uh, that's that's only two years away, but it can change over time. What we need to do in the long run, though, is that we need to change the institution. So we need to stop letting politicians draw their own congressional districts or uh, state assembly or state senate districts. Take that redistricting power out of the hands of the politicians and put it in the hands of the people. Um, we need to make sure that we take big money out of politics so that these politicians are not trying to serve whoever can give them the most money, but trying to serve their average constituents. So there are institutional changes that we need to make so that down the road we can have better uh, collegiality and ability to work across the aisle. What is it about you that you think might set you apart from other Democrats who want to challenge President Trump in 2020? Well, if I run, it's going to be based on uh, my life experience, my experience in public service, and because I have a strong vision for the future of the country. And I look forward uh, to, if I, if I get into that race, uh, a very crowded field, but I think that's going to be good. I believe that it's going to be cathartic for the Democratic Party to go through that after what happened in 2016. And uh, look forward to, to articulating my vision. For so the what is it that future. you stand for then? If you had to kind of simplify it and kind of take that advice, uh, when you are presenting yourself and people who may not be familiar with your story uh, to the American voter, what is it about your story that sets you apart? Well, I got into public service because I felt very blessed with opportunity in my life. And I want to make sure that in the years to come, in what this 21st century demands for people to thrive, 
that folks can reach their own American dream the way that I've reached mine. Uh, the last question I have for you, you open your book by talking about your grandmother's journey to this country at age seven, crossing the border and having a very uncertain future. Um, I wonder what it is that you make of this particular moment in our nation's history when you talk about the immigration debate and such things as family separation policies being discussed, difficult problems that this nation is facing regarding uh, illegal immigration. There are many Americans, as you well know, who feel very strongly that immigration, illegal immigration is out of control. Um, how do you think history will view this moment? As very dark, uh, as not one of the proudest moments in terms of the leadership of our country. Uh, I consider what's happening on the border in terms of family separation to be state-sponsored child abuse. Uh, I believe that that's a human rights abuse, that that is so far removed from what we're supposed to be as Americans and what this country is supposed to stand for, and that history will look back very unkindly to the cruel family separation policy of Donald Trump. The answer is for folks to participate, to go and vote. Uh, not to give up on our democracy and to change the leadership of this country so that not only can people work across the aisle on immigration, but also on our economy, on investing in infrastructure, on, on understanding the role of the United States in the world in this 21st century. And my hope is that in three weeks we're going to find out that the people are ready to do that. And one last question. For the millions of Americans out there who are genuinely fearful when they think about the topic of illegal immigration and they are genuinely frightened for what that means potentially for the future of this country, what is your message to them? That we can have both a secure border, you know, crossings across the southern border are near a 40-year low, and also humanely deal with the 11 million folks who are here who are undocumented. Those two things are not mutually exclusive, and that the vast majority of immigrants, whether they're legal or undocumented immigrants, are law-abiding when they're in the country. All right, Julian Castro, Mr. Secretary, thanks so much for your thanks time. Thanks for having me.